Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay and see me. I feel very short right now. Maybe, Maddie, maybe I need the step stool too. What do you think? Too tall? Good? No, okay, all right. That will save it for you. My name's Carrie Kopp. I'm the principal of the Arnone Elementary School, um, the William Arnone School. Um, the school is named after uh, Dr. William Arnone, who was a long-standing physician in the city of Brockton, but also um, a dedicated um, person, professional, to the school system, and he served on the school committee. And the Arnone School is lucky enough to be named after him. We are what, right around the corner share the neighborhood with the library, um, and we are grateful um, that to be included in today's event. I have brought with me today two, uh, actually I have three students here with me, but two, one is the cheering section, and two are my, some of my fifth graders um, who have developed and written a poem about teachers and uh, specifically how they feel uh, teachers influence them. I also have some of my staff here in the back who are kind enough to come and cheer them on as well. So I'm grateful. I'm very new to the Arnone School. I came from, with some of my previous colleagues here uh, from Brockton High School, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have joined the Arnone uh, family. Uh, it's a neighborhood school with some really wonderful children and families and staff members. So I'd like, without further ado, I would love to be able to introduce to you Maddie Devine and Giselle Glass, who will have a poem to share with you. And they are fifth graders in Ms. DeMarco's class, who is here in the back as well. So come on up, girls. yourselves okay please yeah. Can you? that's the best part about teachers by Giselle and Madison the best part about teachers is that they are kind helpful and positive the best part about teachers is that they make us laugh and they respect boundaries the best part about teachers is they understand us and they're always there for help the best part of our teacher is they create a positive environment for children to learn. Without teachers, we would not be able to get jobs or have a career. The best part of our teacher is they can be very punny with corny jokes. <laughs> the best part of our teachers is they are the key to the future and they're as wise as ours. The best part about teachers is they encourage us to do hard things. We, we love, love our, our teachers. teachers. Woo! Woo! Okay, girls, hold on one minute, okay? Yeah. Great job, girls, thank you very much. And I think we have something to share. And Dr. Cobbs, who is the superintendent of schools, you remember he's come to the Arnone to visit us on occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, he is here to present you with something for your hard work, so thank you. Ooh. Now you're going to have to make a poem about the superintendent. We yeah. <laughs> do? I, I have plenty of jokes, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Cobbs and I are here on behalf of the city, uh, on behalf of both the city council and the mayor's office, to give you these citations to thank you for your work and to congratulate you on your efforts. Thank you. So I'm going to read off the citation from the City Council, which we have, uh, one for both of you, oh, thank you. I'm just gonna take a gander at the other one. Um, official citation, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Giselle Glass and Madison Devine of the Arnone Elementary School in recognition of your representation of the Arnone School and the City of Brockton. You are instilling a love of poetry and inspiring your fellow students by being positive role models. And be it further known that the City Council extends its best wishes for continued success and that this citation be duly signed by the President of the City Council and attested to in a copy thereof transmitted to the Clerk of the Council. And the Mayor's citation says something very similar. So thank you both for your efforts. You did a really good job. Thank you. Giselle? Madison? 
Both are both the same. Both, both, are both, the same. both are Giselles and these, these are both Manus. Okay, these are both Giselles. So I first said Giselle. And then these are both for you. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good job. Hi, everyone. Now, isn't that the best way to start off an event, hearing from our wonderful youth and seeing the direct impact of our teachers? Another round of applause for the kids. <laughs> OK, can everyone hear me OK? OK, what about now? This one? Hello? OK, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to my Brockton Public Library. Thank you for joining all of us today on this lovely Saturday afternoon to celebrate these wonderful educators. My name is Hannah Baptiste. I'm the Brockton Youth Poet Laureate, and I'll be your hostess for this Educator Showcase. Education is the backbone of our society, and I'm thrilled we will get to see these educators display their talents for you all today. Today, educators and students from the Arnone School, Brockton High School, Massasoit Community College, New Heights Charter School, and the Rose Music Conservatory will be sharing their wor words with you all today. We will conclude the event with our keynote speaker, Christina Liu. Now please welcome Brockton City Councilman Jack Lowley and Brockton City Superintendent Dr. James Cobbs. Hi, you haven't seen us before. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil the art of the day by attempting my own poetry. So I'll be, I'll be brief with my remarks, to the, to the doctor's relief. Um, we really appreciate. Uh, the work that you do as, you know, as educators, but also uh, in bringing, uh, you know, in, in, in making your mark culturally in the city through expressions of art like poetry. Um, it, it really is the underpinnings of, of what makes the city the city of champions to see so many people uh, direct their passions so eloquently. Um, but we really do appreciate it, and we'll be here. We have... Uh, some citations for you guys as well, don't worry. <laughs> Dr. Cuff? So, so, I don't know if I need a microphone, can you all hear me? So, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I get invited to these events and at the high school and, and other places, other schools, and I look at my students and, you know, Brockton obviously is taking a lot of heat in a lot of different directions for a lot of people and you know and nobody hesitates to bash our students our schools our administrators our teachers but look what we do every single day look what we produce look what you guys do you're, you're the best and the brightest and brockton is you know we get a bad rap but we know what you guys do teachers and t students you you take care of your business you persevere you will show us your talent and you go on to greater better things I just got a text today from Principal McCaskill, from BHS Principal in the back. And he, we, unbeknownst to us, we have a student that says, hey, I just got accepted to Annapolis Naval Academy. Like, what? <laughs> like, you know, the, that's what I'm talking about. We have the best and the brightest students, and you guys will go on to do great things. And we appreciate you. We love you. So thank you. Are we doing citations now, or is that, are we, okay. All right. I don't know how quick everyone is on their feet on a nice warm Saturday afternoon, but we're going to start shouting you out. From Brockton High, we got all of our Brockton High people? Brockton High. Oh, yeah. Let's get Jamie Vitonis. This is 
from the city council. Let me just move it down. There you go. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry. Your, your inscription does not talk about you being a student. I probably should have read your inscription. I was going to still in high school? <laughs> What'd you write about? There we go. From Massasoit, Katie Demera, or Kate Demera. <laughs> while, you, while you're walking up, we'll do the, we'll do the, the citation. The official citation, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Kate Demera from Massasoit Community College in recognition of your dedication to teaching and advocating poetry and literature on behalf of the arts and culture in the city of Brockton. And be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes on continued success and that the citation be duly signed by the President of the Council and attested to in a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the City Council. Thank you. <laughs> Massasoit's got a couple people. Good job, Massasoit. Mm -hmm. Mark Walsh. <laughs> Be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Mark Walsh from Massasoit Community College in recognition of your dedication to teaching and advocating poetry and literature on behalf of the arts and culture in the city of Brockton. And be it further known that the City Council hereby extends its best wishes for continued success and that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Council and a copy attested to, uh, a copy attested to and a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the Council. Thank you. Next time we're going to have to consult a little and see if we can make these rhyme. <laughs> From New Heights Charter. Josephine Farah. Be it, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Josephine Farah of New Heights Charter School in recognition of your dedication to teaching and advocating poetry and literature on behalf of the arts and culture in the city of Brockton. And be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success that the citation be duly signed by the President of the Council and attested to and a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the Council. I don't got to read all of them. I didn't want to. I didn't want to trivialize anybody's getting the citation. All right, I'm going to run through the names so we can uh, we can actually get to actual actual poetry. Also from New Heights, Nicole Tamarish. You get that right. Hope Fernandes. From the Rose Conservatory. I'd clap for that. Let me see if I can get this better. Ms. Laurel Gabon Bala. Also from Rose Conservatory, Ms. Milen Lords Bala. Now we've got our keynote speaker which we will cite preemptively and then let you speak. Our keynote speaker, Ms. Christina Liu.
Yeah, there's a lot of pressure. We have, yeah. we have a little bit. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll leave these for you here so you can congratulate. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Shall I begin? No? Okay. Thank you all. T we will begin with Brockton High School. Jamie v with Jamie Vitonis. Jamie Vitonis was born and raised in Northeast Ohio until he moved to Massachusetts to attend Boston University. There, he majored in English with a minor in linguistics before becoming an English teacher at Oliver Ames High School in Easton. For the past 16 years, he has been an English department coordinator in various districts including, most recently, his new role as the ELA coordinator for the high schools in Brockton. He lives in Mainsfield with his, with his wife, Alliston, and daughters, Hazel and Nora. Please welcome Jamie Vitonis. Thank you. It's great to be part of an event that celebrates poetry, uh, especially one that connects poetry to young people here in Brockton. For my part, I've been teaching poetry for well over 20 years now, and I'm excited to share with you three poems that I've particularly enjoyed teaching over that time. The first poem was written by Robert Hayden, a man whose life experience was quite different from mine. Still, the poem has always resonated both with me and my students. Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking, when the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? That's it. The next poem I'd like to share with you, I always enjoyed teaching because the old textbooks included with it an important illustration. The poem is called Musée des Beaux-Arts, which is French for Museum of Fine Arts. And it was inspired by a painting by the famous Renaissance Dutch artist, uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder. The painting is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. Quick bit of background, you may know the Greek myth of Icarus, a boy whose father makes wings of wax for his son with the warning, don't fly too close to the sun or the wax wings will melt. And as you know, young boys uh, sometimes aren't terribly keen on listening to their fathers. So Icarus, in fact, does fly too close to the sun and falls to his death as a result. The painting is a typical landscape of the time and with figures going about their everyday lives. But if you look closely enough and you have to really look to see it, you'll see the last bit of Icarus falling into the sea from an incredible height. The poem then isn't about the myth so much as it is about tragedies that happen with little attention paid by the greater world. So this is Musée des Beaux-Arts by W.H. Auden. About suffering they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along? How when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster, 
The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Thanks. My last poem I'd like to read to you today was written by Billy Collins. If you like, you can see any number of his own recitations of his poetry on YouTube. Uh, he's much better than I am at reading it. I don't think there's a poet I find more entertaining. In this particular poem, he reflects on his experience as a child at one of those sum summer camps many of us have been to. On this one particular day, the activity is to make a lanyard, you know, the thing you wear around your neck to keep a key or an identification badge. But in this case, the lanyard is a gift for his mother and happens to be made out of plastic strips. The Lanyard by Billy Collins. The other day I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, moving as if underwater from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, where I found myself in the L section of the dictionary, where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one into the past more suddenly. A past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid long, thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts. And I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted spoons of medicine to my lips, laid cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here I wish to say to her now is a smaller gift, not the worn truth, that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hand, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jamie, for your wonderful recitations. Next up to the mic, we have Philip Hesaurus, the Brockton Poet Laureate. There's an old saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, I want to thank um, Councilman Jack Lally and Superintendent Cobbs, but we must recognize um, Director Paul Engel of the library who gave us this wonderful space um, and all these events. So I graduated in 1971, 50, little over 50 years ago. Um, a couple years ago, we had our class reunion, our 50th class reunion. The class asked me to write a poem reliving our days at Brockton High. A um, couple of reference points. Main Street from um, Belmont Ave to Pleasant Street used to be two ways. And it was called the drag, because every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, 
everybody would gather with their cars and go up and down the street. Does anybody remember American Graffiti? The movie American Graffiti? With all the cars going up and down? That's how it was in Brockton. Um, so this is called We Boxers, We Champions, 1971. We are the children of 71 who emerged from the concrete glass and steel cocoon wrapped in colors of blue, red, yellow, azure, and lest we forget, green. Pockets of learning with the knowledge bestowed on us of science, mathematics, philosophy, the fine arts, music, and theater. Competitive sports ingrained in our sinew, our bodies fueled with the culinary delights, tater tots, limp pizza, fish sticks, sloppy joes, tossed green salad, and the infamous celery and carrot sticks. For dessert, your choice, fruit gelatin, peanut butter squares. Let us not forget the path laid out with the street smarts on playgrounds, hanging out at Westgate, flipping through 45s, the drag papered with American graffiti. Wicked pissa. Can you dig it? Catch you on the flip side. These were the tools for us to build life as we learned how to tuck our cigarette pack into folded sleeve. French kiss, French inhale, the correct measurement of coke to rum, how to slow dance to stairway to heaven, and lest we forget the solution for the perfect tan, baby oil and iodine. <laughs> what were we thinking? Vietnam hung over our heads, a dead weight crushing breath and spirit. The voting age changed to 18. Now you can vote and die in the draft. It's all in the birthday numbers. How many lost? How many changed for life? Imagine all the people. We marched, our voices rising. May Day, May Day, bring them home. And all hell broke loose in our backyard with state police thumping shields, fingers pointed, fists clenched, air thick, madness on the verge. Rap sessions, peace negotiation. Marvin Gaye, what's going on? It's not funny how some things never change. We survived on the Big Mac. Jack in the Box, drive up, 2 AM. Watched Billy, Zap, Billy Jack, sang Joy to the World. All in the family made us laugh at our reality. And we've only just begun. We are the children of diversity, the threads of America evolving and spinning out of our cocoons, wrapped in colors of black and red, white, brown, and lest we forget, yellow. With embryonic wings, we soared beyond our limitations. We flew above the horizon for the rings of tomorrow. Some crumbled, wings fading into dust. Too soon, too soon, too soon, oh, too soon. Names too numerous to mention. Robert imprinted in our memories. Pamela with each loss. Kevin, a small tear. Laurel, to the heart of 71. John, we hold all close. Linda, as we lament each name. Suzanne, and lest we forget, Teresa. They are the brick and mortar of our memories, champions up and down through failure and triumph. And yes, we forged ahead, built and dreamed, created a legacy with the toil and sweat and tears determined to make the soul of the class of 71 uncompromised boxers who champion the rising time and time again and again. We will not be counted out. 
Our class of 71 persevered through the rite of passage, the grit of life experience to shout out loud, your children have grown up. We boxers, we champions. Thank you, Philip, for that insightful trip down memory lane through the, through the lens of education. It's amazing to see how things have changed and stayed the same throughout time. Next up, I'm pleased to introduce Shoshana Marie Wilson to present the first Insight and Inspiration Award to Willie Wilson, Jr. Please welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is it this one? Yeah, I think it's this one. Okay, so I wrote a little bit to introduce my father, so I'm gonna read it. Um, we all know that our first teachers are our parents, our guardians tasked with the honor and immense pressure of raising tiny humans into hopefully one day healthy, happy, functioning adults. For the first four or five years, our eyes are fixed on our parents and we learn everything from them. Our language, our mannerisms, how to communicate. Growing up, our home was filled with laughter, fun, love, and storytelling. My parents would read us stories of escaped slaves' journeys into freedom, Greek tales of mischievous creatures, and stories from scriptures of a great God and brave women and men. We'd watch movies, whether in our living room or at the movie theater, and Dad's commentary was so astute at scenes would add more depth to the story and its characters, always the teacher. Um, informing us mid-scene why a character reacted a certain way, how a scene was shot, the significance of the lyricism of a song playing in the background. It was never annoying. It reminded all my siblings that if we had a question, we could ask our dad, and he'd probably know the answer. My brother Aaron once bought my dad the mug, I don't need to ask Google, my dad knows everything. And instead of this being something my dad toted, totted around with a big head, he was always gracious with his knowledge never giving quick answers, but slowly, but slowing it down and giving it nuance. Even as a young child, I remember asking my dad about different things, and I would always want to have it be black or white. Um, but my dad never gave me an answer like yes or no. Instead, he would give me its history. So it wasn't a shock when I started school in Brockton and every teacher, upperclassmen, principals, and even strangers at grocery stores would come up to me and say, I had your dad as a teacher or your dad is an awesome teacher. Oh, you're Willie Wilson's daughter? Love that man. <laughs> it, it, it simply affirmed what I knew. What an immense honor. Uh, we were never annoyed by it. It was never any pressure. My dad kept it real simple. Do the right thing, be kind and respectful, and be yourself. So I always thought, what a privilege. You already like me because of the greatness of my dad. An unspoken confidence was something I always had when people said these things. While people knew him as a great educator, to me, he's never been just a teacher, but my guide, my loving father, and I get the benefit of witnessing your brilliance up close and personal. What an honor. These. There are great poets, great leaders, great artists, and actors, and oftentimes we're let down when we hear how great they are, but they weren't great people. They weren't great parents to their kids, or they weren't great siblings. What's the point of high, having the highest accolades in the world awarded to you when the people closest to your life have conflicted feelings about how you treated them? I am proud to say many know Will, Willie Wilson Jr. as a great history teacher, a Brockton native, an educator, and historian. Well, I'm honored to say that I know and love him as all these things and also a wonderful father. To the most insightful man I know, I present Willie Allen Wilson Jr. with the Insight and Inspiration Award. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad to be here. And uh, this is a, uh, a special
place for me um, for many reasons, but as some of you might not have known, from the late 1880s to 1905, this was the site of uh, Brockton High. Uh, the A building was built in 1906, and the B building was built in 1916, and of course they're torn down, making room for the, uh, the new uh, public safety building. Uh, my favorite American is Frederick Douglass, and he once said, poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers, and uh, it is so true. Um, in teaching, I always included a, a, a special unit within my class, whether it be African American history or world history, uh, where students would write a poem. And it didn't have to rhyme, but it had to talk about an event or a person or their reaction to what they were studying. And so poetry is, is, is just very important and instrumental in life. And I thank Philip for carrying uh, the, this new tradition. Uh, this past Tuesday, I attended uh, Poetry at Work, the sixth annual Mass General Hospital celebration of National Poetry Month. And uh, Jamie read the poem by uh, Robert Hayden, and that was one of the poems shared there, Those Winter Mornings. And Robert Hayden was an African-American poet from the Detroit area, and that, that poem is so special, and if you have a chance, you need to reread it to get some of the nuances. Um, I felt that I should share one poem, and, um, and the poem that I'm going to read is Miracles by Honor Bontomp. As some of you know, Honor Bontomps was a, um, uh, the best friend of Langston Hughes, and I had uh, the honor and privilege as an undergraduate at Boston College to actually uh, meet uh, uh, Honor Bontomp at a conference. Um, miracles. Doubt no longer miracles. This spring day makes it plain. A man may crumble into dust and straightway live again. A jug of water in the sun will easy turn to wine if love is stopping at the well and love's brown arms entwine. And you who think him only man, I tell you faithfully that I have seen Christ clothed in rain walking on the sea. Uh, thank you so much. I'm privileged and honored to accept this, uh, this award and uh, uh, I graduated from Brockton High in 1970, a year before Philip, and uh, we were the last class from the old high school. And uh, this whole event, it's so important to encourage our young people to appreciate art and literature. Uh, I, I, I agree with the emphasis on STEM, but uh, it's important to remember art and literature as we continue to grow. Thank you very much. I had your dad as a teacher, too. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was given a little bit of information before I came up here that I will share with you and the public now from our poet laureate. You are the last recipient of the um, Insight and Inspiration Award in its current form. The next recipient will be the recipient of the Willie Wilson Jr. Insight and Inspiration Award. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Next stop is a school, so no pressure. <laughs> I'm going to read this one. I know I've read a couple, but bear with me. Official citation, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Mr. Willie Wilson, Jr. in recognition of your insight and inspiration in teaching excellence, forever impacting your students' future and well-being. We bestow our thanks and gratitude on behalf of the arts and culture of the City of Brockton. And be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Council, attested to and a copy thereof transmitted by the clerk of the council. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> well, wasn't that just the sweetest introduction I've ever heard in my life? <laughs> He is very, very clearly well-deserving of that award. Can we get another round of applause for the both of them? <laughs> we are going to continue the event with people from Massasoit Community College. First up, we have Kate DeMarca. Kate DeMarca is an associate professor of English at Massasoit Community College, an advisor to the Student Performing Arts Club and a faculty member of the Global Learning at Massasoit team. Professor DeMarca organizes and fac facilitates Mic Drop Massasoit, a spoken word open mic series at the college. She was instrumental in the planning of World Poetry Day events at Massasoit in 2019 and 2020. She enjoys writing poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and plays. Professor DeMarca is thrilled to see the poetry community here in Brockton grow and thrive. Please welcome Kate DeMarca to the mic. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Philip and the library. This is a wonderful event for the city and the community celebrating poetry and education and our young people. Um, so the first poem I'll read, uh, these are all uh, original poems, is called Live Stream on Palm Sunday. And it's new in the sense that I've never read it before in front of an audience before. I wrote it during the early part of the pandemic when nothing was in person. Even worship services were online. My family is Melkite Catholic, Eastern Rite. And our church services are very similar to Greek Orthodox services. And I describe this a bit in the poem, including direct quotes from our priest that Palm Sunday, which I will attempt to replicate the sound of. So in this poem, I ask, in troubled times, when we are faced with uncertainty, what brings us true comfort and hope? Live stream on Palm Sunday. O oh God, have mercy on me, wash me from malice, and cleanse me from my sin. Palm Sunday, 2020. The clouds cover the morning in Massachusetts, here in my city, a, flu a few blocks from the river. I'm live streaming Palm Sunday liturgy in my apartment. I click like and type hellos to family and try to pray. O oh God, save your people and bless your inheritance. The volume's too soft, and I pull the Bose speakers from the cabinet below my TV and fumble with the cords before I finally plug the left speaker into the right speaker into the laptop into the kitchen wall. I wash a few dishes and put the kettle on for a cup of Earl Grey tea. I wonder if I ought to be multitasking. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. The familiar chanting stirs something within. Melodies in minor key transport me 5,000 miles away. In arid land, the earth bakes under a searing sun. Brown hills frame the horizon. A crowd of villagers approach, kicking up dust and pebbles, singing. The palm fronds they carry send a cool breeze my way as they wave them to and fro. Small children dart and play under their parents' feet, smiling and laughing. They too sing Hosanna. I catch a figure in white, the only person not on foot astride a steady donkey. The kettle shrieks, the steam gushing out of the spout. I pull the kettle off, rings of electric heat. I pour the water into a cup. Next to my laptop, I light a Yankee candle. Glory to you, O oh Lord, glory to you. Where is love that grows forever? Father Martin, robed in crimson and gold, stands by the altar opening the great book. A heavy, hardcover tome adorned itself in crimson, gold, and jewels. The view blurs, out of focus, but jumps to clarity. 
I'm reminded of being 13 and finally securing a contact lens in each eye, hours of struggle rewarded by clear vision. Let us be attentive. The screen cuts out and tells me the live stream has ended. We need technology. Technology is flawed. But I'll go down to the Charles, the river that flows a few blocks away. I'll attend to the holy book of nature. Let us find one another across miles, across time, breathing fresh air, breathing clean air, nature's breath, God's breath, along the banks of this stream. Under bright bird song and branches of green, a spirit connects us all in its flow, a love that grows forever. This next poem was untitled for a long time until years after I wrote it, a title came to me. I tell my students, you can work on a piece of writing for a very long time. If you're stuck, the ideas will come eventually if you don't give up. And on that note, this poem is about the creative process and taking those first steps toward creating something. It's called Sleeping Underground. Sometimes it's dormant, like a volcano. Hibernating, like a bear. Hiding, like a rabbit. Sleeping underground. It waits for spring? No. For you. Let hot words climb high and burst into air. Let them flow over hard rocks and burn as truth. Watch them yawn and wake, lumber then walk. Feel the morning sun and roar. See them sniff, twitch their long ears, and hop tentatively toward hope. And this poem features a little girl who may or may not be me and her love of a certain pastime. It's also my homage to middle grade fiction. There's nothing like escaping into a good book as a middle schooler, and I'm currently writing my own middle grade fantasy novel. And so this is Light That Makes a Dark Place Home. She reads, of mountains climbed and conquerable quests, of magic journeys and heroines with hearts, of wicked witches, rogues, rascals, and villains, of truths to discover and rewarded self-trust. The pages illuminate the dark. This is the last one, it's short, and it's because summer is right around the corner. So let me take you to New Hampshire's beautiful Hampton Beach with the surfing lesson. Flat on our bellies on the long styrofoam boards, we waited. Collecting with the uh, collective unconscious of the planet, he said. And why not? Bobbing back and forth in salt water, he held our boards as our bodies lay extended. He knew the exact right moment when a wave came to say, one, two, three, go, as he pushed our boards toward shore. A jolt of energy needed to jump up and hold. Look up. Always look where you want to go. Forward, never back. Steady, sure, suddenly, strong. Thank you, Kate DeMarca. Your joy really radiates through your poetry. <laughs> Next up from Massasoit Community College, we have Mark Walsh. Mark Walsh is an English professor at Massasoit Community College in Brockton, Massachusetts, where he teaches literature and philosophy. His journalism and reviews have appeared in, in the South Shore News and the Marshfield Mariner, Solstice, the Lily Poetry Review, and Wilderness House Literary Review. 
His latest poetry publications include The Lily Poetry Review, Rituals, The Beatneck Cowboy and Abandoned Mine. In April of 2023, his poem Slow Wine was part of an art installation that sits outside the entrance to the Brockton Public Library. Please welcome Mark Walsh. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Philip. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> He's got a couple poems I'd like to read. Well, uh, Kate was making reference to New Hampshire in her last poem, so I'd like to pick up with a reference to uh, New Hampshire. In this poem, um, referencing a resort that my family and I used to go to uh, and vacation at, uh, but this actually is a poem about mischief. It's called Observances. Thoreau knew an anthill could provide an afternoon's entertainment. Back much further, 12-year-olds were sent by parents to gather acorns for the tribe. One summer resort day, my buddy and I let our suburban minds hatch a swell idea. Grab up the Dayglow coffee cans repurposed as lounge chair ashtrays, dump them in the creek that ran under the cement swimming pool, and watch them tumble down the short falls beyond the tree line. A good hour's amusement before we got nabbed, loudly lectured, made to climb down slippery stones and gather up every dented can our stubby fingers could reach. A large crowd enjoyed the justice. Later, we shrugged it off with a laugh, blind to the real crime. People of wilderness cultures rarely seek out adventures. Boredom is the god that gets us in the end. This is, uh, thank, thank you. This is a new poem um, that I have not read in, in public yet. This is called A Silent Note in the Night. A winter to slow the mind, moon scrapes a spare and spindled branch. In my homeland, I live like the homeless, introduced by mad foreigners who traded the wild for wholesale scents. It's not enough to smell the ripening air when ghosts around here ignore me. The landscape sings a certain song to a native, but what part of melody can an immigrant son hear? I shout and stomp on Wampanoag land, slobber the earth like a sludgy fumori spreading seaweed on a path to keep me from becoming the path. Is anyone the church where they pray? Birdsong is a warning that this place is not yours. Bart owls hoot a nine-note phrase with a silent tenth note in case we listen in the night. Alive, alert, I look into western darkness, gauge the strangeness of time. When we claim the ground, we accept the shape of our feet. Without a compass, it never feels complete. A lost note held in cold silence as we rename a land with our streets. Thank you. There's a, uh, a young pop star um, on the scene emerging. Uh, you might not have heard of her. Her name is uh, Taylor Swift, and I, I predict uh, great things for her in the future. And so she just released an album um, that's referencing tortured poets. And she's right. Poets are tortured. And I would like to read this next poem about the thing that probably tortures poets most, which is submitting your poems to magazines over and over again and have them rejected over and over and over again. But like anything else, it depends on how you look at it. If you change the angle of trajectory a little bit, you can start to view it in a more positive light. And this is a poem I call Weird Worth. A day devoted to submissions is a damn good day indeed. Parsing guidelines, decoding a magazine's content before the mad assembly of four batch poems pasted Doc X style and cover lettered with care that gives value to stark, unboxed hours. I track attempts on spreadsheets, catalog annoying details only I care about, 
because making a submission is marking time, is marking a tree, or tagging your name on the highway overpass. Even reading the Yes You Can books other poets write for food serves meaning, each page offering entry to a place of purpose locked in me, fueling the weird worth that, mean, that maintains my tiny stall in this ramshackle marketplace. The business of poetry is not skydiving or the skim of a new lover's thigh. It's the feeling of boots on a mountain trail. The next step carries the beauty of something to look forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Walsh, and thank you to both our professors from Massasoit Community College for sharing your poetry with us. Next up, we have New Heights Charter School. We're going to begin with Josephine Farah. Born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, a first-generation Lebanese-American um, Lebanese teacher working in Brockton, Massachusetts, Josephine has been a longtime writer and presented for the first time on our stage a few years ago. She has worked on poetry, as well as being a presenter for many years. Josephine has a bachelor's in English and education, as well as a, cert as a certification in teaching English as a second language. A big fan of Poe, darkness, and creepiness. Writer of happiness, pain, education, and mental health. Please welcome Josephine Farah. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. How's it going? Yes, yeah, still really awkward. Doesn't matter where I am. Um, I kind of wish I could go along and like have the really like upbeat happiness. Um, everything I write is pretty dark, so just do it. All right, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, so. The first poem is gonna, I'm going to read is a poem I write, wrote in this past year. Um, I lost my first student, and it really crushed me. Uh, so I wrote this poem, and it is titled, But I'm Not a Mother, and it is dedicated to Terry Boston. <sighs> but I am not a mother. I have kids, but I am not a mother. I put Band-Aids on cuts, I listen with open ears, offer hugs, I've been a shoulder to sob on, but I'm not a mother. I lost my first child this year, but I am not a mother. I sobbed with my whole heart watching you go, but I'm not a mother. The strength it would take to be a mother goes beyond me. Some of the strongest out there seeing their hearts outside of their bodies. I have kids, but I am not a mother. Thank you. Uh, the second poem I wrote for this is First Generation. Um, as Hannah said, I am a first generation Lebanese American. My parents immigrated here in 88. Um, so kind of the mentality of what it's like to be first generation. <clears throat> you were told you had potential before you took your first breath. You have been seen as the future, the example and the one that changes it all, even before you could walk. You escaped fire, you walked through ice, you did amazing things all before you could talk. You were created from broken hands, broken hearts, and broken dreams. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, the next one I'm gonna read is called Packed Bags. Um, being Middle Eastern in America, it's been really difficult with all of the turmoil that's going on. Um, so I wrote this after a very intense conversation with one of my family members. So it's called Packed Bags. When I go back home, the bags are packed to the brim. With food that you may never find and clothes for half the price. For my family who makes less than anything we think of. Who make what I make in a day and a month. I have my bags packed. In case they bomb us up here, said the voice on the line, trembling but stern. But all the baggage has shown through. I have my bags packed in case they bomb us. Thank you. Uh, the last one I'm gonna read is a little bit more lighthearted. I wrote this the first time I got to perform at the teacher showcase, and it was also my first year teaching. Um, this is, I'm going into my fourth year teaching at this point, but my first year teaching was very insightful of uh, how kids view me. And so this one is titled, Your Kid's Favorite Role Model. I am your kid's favorite role model. I've got tattoos and piercings, what they don't know is how much I swear outside of the four walls of my well-decorated classroom. The creations added to my body that get me second looks walking down the street. The creations added to my body that show art goes beyond our fourth wall, four walls. Miss Farah, which one hurt the most? Mitch Farah, where did you get the idea? Will you get one for us? Did this get them thinking about Demetrius and Lysander? Did this spark the idea of Helen and Hermia's lives? No, probably not. Possibly, depends on how they saw them and how many tattoos they had. This was the reason I was here. Extend their thinking and force them to go beyond the four walls of their minds. How do we connect the dots to their interests? Monkey's Paw and Horror, Shakespeare movies way before their time, gaps that can be filled by simple conversations, spaces that we fill with creativity and imaginations. I am your kid's favorite role model, tattoos and all. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Your love for your students really shines through your poetry. <laughs> Next up from New Heights Charter School, we have Hope Z. Fernandez. Hope Z. Fernandez is a proud educator who has taught for decades and was a school administrator with data-driven experience in equity and inclusion. She has been a teacher, director of language acquisition, assistant principal of discipline, assistant principal of teaching, learning, 504s and special education principal, Visit, visiting lecturer at Bridgewater State College as well as University of Massachusetts, Boston. Ms. Fernandez has been writing poetry since her formative years. Her love for poetry stems from her mother who had a poem for every life situation. Hope describes poetry as honoring and celebrating each other as humans in the most compassionate, mindful, and humble ways. Her poetry celebrates Cape Verdean culture and her mother. Please welcome her Hope Fernandez. Listening to that, I'm wondering, who is that lady? <laughs> The first, first I want to say that this poem I'm about to read was written in a dark time. Um, but I didn't, re and I wasn't going to read it, but one of my colleagues asked me to read it. And I walked in here early to save the space because I don't like to present. And I saw Philip. And it occurred to me that he helped me edit this poem. So where it is today is because of you a long time ago. <laughs> it's called Deathbed. At the last moment, 
My wish is that my body might be still be moving. Let it quiver and jerk if it must like a female cat that's just been mated. Or like the epileptic whose brain charges, shoots shock waves across the nerves, let it spasms joints into frolicum throws, muscles and tendons tugging at each other like branches in a hailstorm. Let the entire apparatus be thrown into unappeased contortion if it must, or let it tremble like aspen leaves on the bank of the sluggish, sun-dappled stream. I am not choosy. It can rise towards a rapturous embrace, if that's what it wants, with death's ecstatic thrust. Out of terror finality, the slam down of iron gates onto granite walls, it has my permission to squirm and cower, if it wishes, or simply form persistent nail drives of pain. It may need to lie on the bed drenched in sweat, no ice towel cools, and simply right there on blister blistering sheets. Anything will do. Just let it move. What motion it chooses, at least let all those queasy voyeurs, nurse, family, those who wait to cart off the corpse, gaze stupefied, speech riven from them, with only platter-wide eyes, merciless and morbid like gawkers at car crashes, like mobs that mill at great fires. And after that, after they have drunk it all, got their fill, and let them speak my death dance, even the last generation. Let me be the hand-me-down story, the thread that gathers the family along its genes so that multitudes of great-grandchildren who never read poems will know an ancestor put up a great last stand. But whatever movement erupts, let my body stage it, not the green light that rides a screen to graph an imperceptible pulse as it flickers lower, lower, low. Until the unwavering line is all that's left, what does a line know about how my body lifted to the crest of sex, how it played through the wash of spring rain, chopped trees as tall as itself, how it swam? So they get lighter from here. <laughs> this poem, um, as a first generation and second generation Cape Verdean, I see um, my students, some that don't speak the language and some that do speak the language, and how are we going to capture it? And so I wrote this Limbra, Cape Verdean Creole for Remember. I like to write fictionalized narratives about relatives no one wants to claim. Peculiar ladies that chew tobacco and let the brown drivel fill their lip wrinkles and chin crease that smoke pipes. Powerful mothers that bore 15, 9, 7 children in their prime. Working women that hid their hair from the sun with cotton scarves, picked Cape Cod cranberries or carried water on their heads, pounded corn into flour for mere bread. Storytellers who sat in the shade of a mango tree on the slope of a volcano, legs wide open catching shell bean husks in their skirts as they vie for their podium with obili, obili, listen here, listen here, toothlessly gumming up the ash of days gone by. This is what I like to write, Polaroid stories for ancestors who may not even comprehend the word lembra. <laughs> and I have two more. This one is my favorite. Um, this time of year is hard for me because my mother was a gardener. She was an artist, and this poem is about her garden. This flower was created by her, um, so I wear it because it's not her physical garden, but it's a different one of her gardens. Isabel's Garden. A pointillist painting, colors lifted from various sources, paprika poppies pillaged, white peonies picked up by the botanical klepto, endangered Pepto-Bismol pink lady slippers multiplied exponentially, were rescued while enjoying a woodland walk. The plastic bag, wet towel, spoon, mere coincidence. 
monumental lilies with peppermint speckled collars, well, cemetery pillages. Isabel's gone, yet her cherished one thrives. Attentive bleeding hearts, tiger lilies wave in summer breezes, tipsy tulips tango, hyacinth breath fills the air, each unique, each with a story, each puts a smile on the keeper of Isabel's secret. And the last one is silence. And I don't know if anybody knows about Jason Reynolds, but I'm all about Jason Reynolds these days. And we're fortunate at New Heights that he will be coming to our school. In one of the chapters of his book, he was to, uh, the main character had lost their parent. And he came home. And the silence of coming home when, in the absence of your parents lingers. And I wrote this. And it goes along those lines. Silence. Um, for my cousin Marie Fernandez Arcot. Two cousins sit alone on a deck one day after a funeral. Ten years have separated and distanced us, us who had once enjoyed each other's company daily. In ten years, babies become children. In ten years, middle age becomes old. Yet nothing as dramatic had changed us. We remained friends. We're family after all. Across a pollen-dusted table, she spoke of the newly created silence, the absence of her father's voice, the vastness of the house, lack of glue to keep the family together. I listened with worldly knowledge. The passing of parents is a journey one must travel alone. Neither aphorism nor metaphor is preparation for this odyssey. I traveled this weed-cluttered dirt road with bare feet, cracked heels, yet 10 years almost to the day from the silence my cousin complained of, I understand irony. For once or twice, I complained of my mother's noise, incessant phone chatter, unappreciated, unappreciated advice, gossip, loud laughter. Yet today, I would trade diamonds to hear it again. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Next up, we have Nicole Tamrisk. Nicole Tamrisk is a lover of writing, a mother, a teacher, and an instructional leader at New Heights Charter School in Brockton who inspires and empowers her students to become change makers and thought leaders through the art of writing persuasively. She has a master's degree from Boston University. She has taught internationally. She believes that learning ignites a spark that when nurtured with intention, develops into a steady flow of creativity. Born in Saudi Arabia, half Colombian, Nicole's new unique story and pet unique story and voice will inspire you to pick up your pen whenever it be writing a poem, a research paper, or writing a protest slogan on a poster. She will inspire you to do it all. Please welcome Nicole Tamrisk. Okay, I got some props. I can't do this without saying hope. That was awesome. I love that last poem. All right. So hello, everyone. I want to share the same introduction I gave last year to this event because uh, I think it's still relevant. And now my friend and mentor who introduced me to this event is actually here and can hear it. So I am a writing teacher who's still somewhat afraid of picking up the pen when it comes to poetry. Yet I have a fierce appreciation bordering on obsession with reading poetry and sharing poetry and hearing poems from my students. One of my favorite poets might be a poet you all know, Emily Dickinson. And as a teenager, I used to keep a pocket-sized version of her poems on my person, in my back pocket. I had it with me all the time. Like my mother's rosary beads, they were always there, and I would write all the time, journals and journals. They surrounded me like castle walls. It was how I made sense of the world. But somewhere along the way, 
I stopped writing. I got married. I had kids. I found other interests. The point is this. I told myself I was not a writer anymore. And we often believe the negative self-talk. So I just stopped writing. Now, Hope Fernandes has been many things to me these past years at New Heights Charter School uh, here in Brockton. She's my mentor, a fellow teacher, a friend, and inspiration. But when I found out she was a poet, and not just a poet, but a fabulous poet, it reminded me of the power and the danger of binary thinking. We can be more than one identity at a time. We are never one story. And so parts of our identity can go dormant, and then they can blossom again in the right environment, with the right soil. So for the sake of my students, for the sake of my colleagues, for the sake of myself, I've been dabbling and picking up my pen and allowing myself to explore being a writer again. So I'm going to share a few of the poems with you. And I also want, because there's students here, to frame some of these poems, to give you some of the context and the process so you can see that writing doesn't have to be an endeavor that inspires fear it can actually stem from genuine curiosity. So here's the context for the first poem. You guys ready for this? I want you to imagine my husband is away on a business trip, which means I am now both mom, dad, and a teacher. And so I juggle a lot of things, but it's only manageable when Sean is there. So this poem was written the morning he came home again. The exact moment that I heard the sound of the coffee grinding. My husband, right, we all have our love languages. His is active service. Every morning I get a cappuccino, every single morning. When I heard the sound of that grinding of that machine, the Colombian in me who needs her coffee knew at that exact moment with him home that everything would be all right. So part of my writing process is I like to incorporate quotes, titles of things. So at that time, I was watching my favorite show. I was obsessed with the show. I don't know if you guys know it, Orange is the New Black. So this is the quote that's going to start the poem. It's from one of my favorite characters, Susanna Warren, from Orange is the New Black. It's like the sky is blue, right? But when there are clouds, you think it's gray. But really, it's still blue. It hasn't changed. It's just covered with gray clouds passing by. And your clouds will pass by. He is back. The sound of the coffee grinding machine lets me take a breath and pause. Let me know that I'm not the only one who has to hold up this sky. My state of mind is a constant shifting and swirling of clouds. They collect at times in dark, ominous puffs, threatening my sense of self. Until I remember Susanna's words pushing me forward, letting me take another breath, another pause, another moment of inter, inner metacognitive reflection. These are just passing clouds. This is not my sky. My sky is wider than this brain's trembling thoughts. This sky holds the weight of the world on its shoulders. This sky needs to let the birds out of their cages and let them kiss the sky. This sky needs to empty its worry like buckets of rain into the world. Because if it does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its strength. And I need to be strong even when I'm not. Or we can pretend the dirt is the feelings. This floor is my mind, and that is called coping. One way or another, I get through this thing called life with words. Sometimes my words, sometimes other people's words, words that stand tall like scra skyscrapers against the skyline. They exist like shafts of light that can never crumble from the weight of fury or terror or even the passing of clouds. Okay, that's the first one. And for those who know Emily Dickinson, that one is inspired by the poem, The Brain is Wider Than the Sky. Um, okay, second one. So this next poem is inspired by my friend Hope, and uh, one of her poems deals with mortality. And so I decided to take my pen and think about mortality and the fact that we are 60% water. 60% water. The name of the poem is called Whispers of Eternity. In the silent garden of being, where time carves its legacy with invisible hands, I stand a monolith of memories, a granite chest of stones weathering storms of seconds. 
but within a river runs, a murmuring soul that dances with the cadence of raindrops, spilling over edges seeping into the cracks of my stone cast will, echoes of a former self, whispers in the wind, one etched in fervent fire across the sky, a tapestry of dreams, vibrant, unwielding, now soft hues, bleeding into the dusk of years. What once was a fortress of wild desires, ambitions that soared on the wings of dawn, stands muted. The relentless tide of hours washing away the fervor of youth's relentless drum. Yet beneath the surface where shadows sleep, love's gentle current still ebbs and flows, carrying fragments of forgotten days, resurrecting moments delicate and close. So here's the cosmic joke. A laid bare, I am water, mostly a fluid scape, yet part of me, obstinate, feels like stone, defiant, enduring, shaped by time's relentless drape. But even stone is not just stone. You see, it's carbon, it's stardust, it's you, it's me, born from the explosions of ancient suns. We're the living contradiction, the paradox one. In the dance of impermanence, we find our beat, a harmony and discord, bitter and sweet, for in our design, the eternal and the ephemeral twine together as roses and thorns thrust into our sides. We are but stardust suspended in time. All right, this next one, I thought you were gonna read the bottled up poem. So this next one is about um, education and this PLC that I've been running with Dr. Vidmar at our school um, about having courageous conversations on race and identity. It's called Echoes in the Digital Halls. I just wrote it today, so please bear with me. Uh, beyond the human scale, we scale walls, virtual realities where intimacies got new def definitions. Thousand friends on Facebook, likes and mentions, but not a soul to walk the dog when night falls. We've traded community for convenience, disconnected from the earth, her rhythms and her resonance. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. We're humming to the tune of artificial doves. Democracy's become a myth we're sold, a fairy tale in a world that's cold, where the lies our teacher told us became the chains that try to hold us, Carrots and sticks, rewards and tricks, a system broken. Can we fix the way we learn, the way we teach, restore, transform within reach? The master's tools were never meant to dismantle the master's house. School, students ain't vessels, knowledge ain't a ruse. It's the lighting of a flame, not the filling of a pail. But my cup overflows, responsibilities like hail. Exhausted, overwhelmed, peacekeeper, entertainer, social worker in a system that's a drainer, documenting every move like I'm big brother, when trust is what we need to give one another. I want to scream, shout, let it all out. Talk to my peers, dissolve the doubts. There's a better way to educate, to elevate. But first, we must not be afraid to devastate the walls of oppression, the echoes of our power, blind to the chains we reinforce hour by hour, critical conversations on race, on the human race, restorative justice in every single case, relinquish power, give voice, give choice, let the youth be heard, let's amplify their voice. There was a line on the other page but I like the class. It starts with us to tear down, to build anew, to see education for the potential it's overdue. All right, this is the last one. This one's about my daughter. I'm gonna show you a picture. I got three. I got a teenager, a preteen, and I got this one. She's seven, she's fearless. Between the ages of 10 to 12, Women's confidence plummets because of puberty, because of what society tells women they can and cannot do. I do not want that to happen to my daughter. I think about it all the time. 
So how do I protect her, but also give her a sense of what's coming? And I, I wrestle with this a lot. So this poem is about how I struggle with a world my children are going to inherit. How do I prepare them for a world that I don't still fully understand myself? So the name of the poem is inspired by a podcast, Brene Brown. It's called Beyond the Human Scale. OK. Told you I had props. Here they are. You guys know her, them, hopefully. All right, Falling Up, A Light in the Attic, Good Night Moon, and Runaway Bunny. These are the books I read my daughter at night, gifting her a world where fairness and safety take flight, a gentle fiction to keep the real night terrors out of sight. How do I tell my, wor my daughter about the world that won't overwhelm her heart? When even in first grade, she's hand been handed breathing sticks to play her part. And mass shooting drills leave shadows that dart through her dreams, tearing my soul apart. Drill and kill with literacy and math becomes the daily norm, while play, an essential spark, is confined just to recesses form. Neuroscience tells us play shapes the brain, gives us a chance to be free, yet connections we need are lost in the digital storm. Glued to our screams, screens in echo chambers, we're stuck in a loop. The news turned off because it paints too much human cruelty in a single scoop. She picks up a piece of chalk, drawing hope in a wide, bright arc. Sunshines, rainbows, world peace, she writes, stark against my heart breaking, because I know reality's bite is no lark. Make art, not war, feels like a slogan from a world that's now too far. Our phones show us the horror, no need to look to the stars, protest, pain across the globe. How do we let out a collective sob loud enough to be heard over the mind-numbing tick-tock blob? We need presence to live within a scale that's truly human, not like Icarus chasing the sun with wings too frail, where wax gives way to hubris and high hopes turn pale. It's in humbler skies where the voices of our elders sail, whispering wisdom, telling tales that can tip the scale. We need to temper fire with the patience of the wise. Let the stories of those before us open our eyes. It's not just about the fall or the rise, but the listening, the learning, where true strength lies. So let's not just question, but also seek to understand, joining, joining hands with past and present to heal this land. It's in the melding of minds, the young and the grand, that we find the courage to rise up and take a stand. The wax melts, the resolve burns, we need to take a solid stand, to do something, anything about death's growing sand. Pick up a poster, join a protest, write that letter, take a stance, boycott that corporation, know that change isn't just happenstance. Don't let your political action just be another digital dance. Do more with your power because we are not without chance. The revolution isn't for the screen. It starts in the quiet, unseen, with phones down, eyes meeting eyes, where genuine connection glean. It's about being present, fully seeing one another in each other's joys and pain. We discover we are not alone, not meant to cover, but to observe, to enjoy, to endure, and to recover what's lost when we live beyond the human scale. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all the teachers at New Heights Charter School. I can only imagine the insightful minds that are growing in your class because of you guys. Next up, we have the Rose Music Conservatory. We'll begin with Lauro Gabon Bala. Rose Music Conservatory, Lauro Gabon Bala, village mother, educator, student textile designer, change agent, born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, neighborhoods of Roxbury and Dorchester, proud Brockton resident of 25 years, instructional building para at Raymond Elementary School and head of academic support at the Rose Conservatory. Her passions are family, education, 
social justice, and the arts. She enjoys traveling, music, and food. Please welcome Laurel. Thank you. Um, we didn't have a chance to update the bio um, at South Middle School um, at the moment. Um, is my, my new home, um, but I enjoy working in Brockton. Um, gonna share something. I wanna say thank you uh, to Hope for allowing me uh, the opportunity to, to Lambda. With that, you transported me to a time and space, I remember. So, so thank you for that. Um, let's pull this up on my phone. This is a little bit of an identity piece. Ami e Cabo Verdeana, que ne Celina Marca, minha língua é tudo bisturado, si que gente grande ta fran. Gente Lina Marca, que sabe mi e Cabo Verdeana, sempre te perguntam, oi de onde? Oi espanhola? Árabe? Italiana? Não. Mia criola, creditam, ma cabo verdianos e tudo transado. Tudo mundo popena nos ilia. And that translates into, I am Cape Verdean, born here in America. My tongue is all mixed up, referring to my dialect. That's what the elders tell me, at least. People here in America don't know I'm Cape Verdean. Always asking, where are you from? You're Spanish? Middle Eastern? Are you Italian? No. I'm Criala. Believe me. Caverdians are a blend of everywhere. All the world has stepped foot on our shores. My own two feet touch the shores of the island of Brava, island of my grandparents, wild Brava, Green Brava, in the year 2015, a year after their departure from this earth. We voyaged there to return them home, scatter their ashes of the bodies that encapsulated their souls. There I discovered my roots. In Brava, I entered my grandparents' world. Standing on the tiny dock of Furna shore, I peered out onto the vast, deep blue ocean and found a new and deeply profound respect for the courage it took to leave these shores into the unknown. Immediately following was immense gratitude for the fierce pair, the matriarch and patriarch that created our lineage. I felt even closer to them now. I knew them better now. On the island, their stories became vibrantly alive. I saw with my own eyes the places my imagination had taken me when my grandmother shared her grandmother's stories. I could picture her running through the tree-lined valleys of Kampubashu, laughing that laugh that made her eyes curl up and tears run down her face, that belly laugh. I could see her chasing my grandfather, as I was often told she did. He was only a year her senior, and it was said she was crazy about him since the time they were little children. She was always finding him to play. I imagine he might have been annoyed. I imagine he secretly liked it. In the end, he only survived three weeks without her. I was also transported to my childhood days, running the streets of Dorchester and Roxbury with my friends, thinking how I would have loved it there, playing in the dirt, laying in the sun, swimming in the ocean. I would have certainly climbed those mango trees as I climbed the trees back home. Only in the end, there would have been a reward of a delicious ripe mango. I could taste it. I could feel the juice running down my face. I went into their childhood homes. What a privilege, deeply grateful. Walk through the rooms and imagine quite a time. I saw the faces of my great grandparents, my grandparents, their siblings, going about the day-to-day -day in the rooms between the walls, cooking, pounding corn in the courtyard, the sounds, the laughter, the tears. I imagine celebrations, 
the ones I heard about, like New Year's Eve, when there was music and dancing and food, and they would go house to house and continue on throughout the night, followed by a symphony of music and singing. What a time. I could hear it. I could feel it. My body swayed. I grinned from ear to ear. When I finally left Brava, wild Brava, green Brava, where my roots were planted deep, I was transformed. A mi e Cabo Verdiana. Thank you, Lauro. Next up from the Rose Music Conservatory, we have Milan Lordsbala. Milan Lordsbala was born and raised in Brockton with an overwhelming love for art of all forms. She's dedicated to pursuing a joy-filled and purposeful life. She currently works at the Rose Music Conservatory for Brockton's elementary level students. Please welcome Milan. Hello everyone, my name is Milan. I live by the notion that we are a mosaic of everyone we have ever loved. Today I have two, two poems, one more romantic and one plutonic. I do not prefer to write about love. There is not much to say without sounding cliche, but what a wondrous thing it is to have love that feels like peace. What a wondrous thing it is to be seen clearly. Not to be loved blindly or with a rosy tint, but truly, fully, and clearly. No embellishments, just me. He is not a romantic in the generalized definition of the word, which may be daunting to some, but it is lovely. No antics. Slow burn to the bottom of the wick, he has seen it all. Clearly, no tint. He once said I am a warm, steady, burning flame. No sparks because I am a constant. A lighthouse of sorts, burning bright and guiding from a distance seen through the greatest of storms. Rain. They say what you water blooms, but often they forget the key component, component of oxygen. Oxygen to grow, and oxygen is required for a flame to keep burning. I'm an eternal flame, glowing, burning, breathing, and it feels like peace. Thank you. The second one is for all the influential female friendships I've had, and it's called Treehouse Rock Whiskey Lattes. Pink peeks through the poorly painted cream walls of my bedroom, and I am reminded of the little dear one who was once me, and the gem of a being who grew beside me since age four. The girl with the sun-spotted face and dirty blonde hair, I am reminded of us. The darkened balls of our feet from fairy walking on the pavement and through her wild garden. The disappointment when our fathers called us home at dusk. Housewarmings we've hosted in our tastefully decorated tree houses adorned with clover and dandelions. The smell of chlorine on our skin. The sounds of giggles and wheezes after causing rambunctious scenes on the streets of Brockton. All fun, of course. Theatrical, if you will. We had a way of portraying original characters fully with perfect execution. The seasons changed without us even knowing. Waiting outside for one another with frozen fingertips and blue lips. And suddenly it was the coldest season of our lives. Snow falls and I am reminded we barely talk anymore. Only about perfect places we have been and the places we once thought we'd go to together. Glorious mountains and great lakes. The lakes. Shimmering waters and worn out docks will always remind me of her. The girl I met at the wild age of 13. The girl with person's skin and a birthmark on her leg that resembled the continents of the earth. Earth. She gave me such a new appreciation for the earth. A new love for this earth was born in her grandfather's lake house in the middle of the woods. It was so simple yet grand. Holding hands, we'd jump in the water and swim out to a far island. When I'd return home, she would send me weekly letters each one intricately decorated with the girliest of girly things, always written in a violet glitter gel pen. Immaturity tore us apart, but I will always remember the summer by the lakes, ice cream at Nona's, book browsing, ABBA on repeat, and drinking disgustingly expensive lattes. Lattes. 
Carb blub, eam no shug. Only one girl in the entire world knows what the hell that means. We met working at a particularly chaotic coffee shop, and from then on, she has been my best friend. She is the most vibrant being I have ever known, and her glow is infectious. My kids will call her auntie, and they will know that since 16, together we were wild and free, completely unfazed by people's opinions of our shenanigans. We were girls together, and now we are women together. And through her, I met Miss May. Miss May, she is spring, rounded and always blooming, met her at 17, young and sweet. She is a creative soul with a love for indie rock and roll. Whether swaying next to each other at a live music concert or crammed in Bestie's bed having a debrief, she's always glowing. Glowy, wild, and fierce, 19, on the streets of Angra do Jorismo and Ponta Delgada, where I truly got to know my adventure buddy. The talking never stopped. Days of doing her hair in my hotel room, market lunch dates, mixing whiskey with far too many things, and of course, not so gracefully walking home together. The perfect mix of intellectual conversation and pure nonsense. Together we stripped away all the labels that were no longer serving us, because we are women now. I'm a woman now. So I poorly paint over my baby pink walls that have been with me since birth. I don't know what happens at the end, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Milan. And thank you to all of our educators who performed today. Can we get another round of applause for them? <laughs> At this moment, I would like to point out the plexiglass on the, in the back corner. It has a lot of thank you notes from students to their teachers. So before you leave today, make sure to go read them so you can see the impact they've had on their lives. To conclude this event, we have our keynote speaker, Christina Liu. Christina Liu holds a BA in Writing, Literature, and Publishing and an MFA in Creative Writing from Emerson College. Formerly an ESL counselor, she is currently Senior Academic Advisor in Liberal Studies Faculty at Boston Architectural College. Creative workshops include From Madelines to Umani, Poetry on Gastronomy, in, col in collaboration with Rhode Island's Frequency Writers. Christina was co-organizer co for the Boston Poetry Marathon from 2020 to 2023, raising funds for causes such as Black Lives Matter, Stop Asian Hate, and Reproductive Justice. Recent readings include the Boston Poetry Marathon, the Boston Poetry Salon, Jamaica Plains Chapter and Verse, she slash PVD Festival in, in Providence, Rhode Island, and the Brockton Public Library's Voices of Diversity and Everyone Has a Voice series. She dreams in spare moments of green places, rushing waters, and dumplings. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Christina Liu. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for everybody. It has been a very, very full reading thus far. Um, I, I truly appreciate everyone sticking around. I was trying to glean some, some of the very common themes among this very diverse, extremely multi-generational um, crowd. And you know, I, I think some of the, the themes that really jumped out at me were owning one's voice. And also more importantly, that this whole issue of you know, feeling like we are all moving around amongst a lot of different cultures. Um, it, was, it was really interesting because when the first generation or second generation um, you know, uh, issue was mentioned, I, I, I just kind of sparked. I leapt up and I, I looked over at my husband, I looked over all around the room, and I, I, I just knew that we all felt it in some fashion, no matter how long or how briefly we or our family have been in this country. So I, I thank all of you for that. Um, I was initially going to write, uh, to read um, an essay called The Poet in the Classroom, but I was actually inspired by the litany of, of readings that we've had thus far. So I was in the back of the room culling some poetry that I, th I think will relate, um, you know, certainly in terms of uh, many different backgrounds, but, but also to the theme of the day. And I hope you enjoy them. The first one is an education of my own sort. It's called Lunar New Year Poem. 
and it actually has to do with my, my own kind of informal education in Chinatown, New York City. Lunar New Year poem. I dreamt of blood red canary pages edged in saffron. One horizon, one dash. The pigeons outside I'll grime. I'll cracked glass overlooking Triborough Bridge. I'll tribe, warbled. I was always afraid of firecrackers each new year. Couldn't tell them apart from red envelopes, red badges, red shame on my face at the food stamps and lunch tickets. My sister and I never had strawberry jello until public school, quivering and intact in its artifice. We swallowed while a fire crackled new animals, rams, pigs, tigers, dragons breathing into our small cavities, sharp tongues lashing on our faces, blood welts. Thank you. And this piece, um, I, I, I love community colleges. I was, I was lucky enough to participate in the La Guajua um, Poetry Festival um, about a year ago, around this time. And it's, this poem has been anthologized. It's called For Liberty. For Liberty. She stands back to the billowing wind, the green isolated wreckage of a gift long rusted pain by consumption and a thousand centuries of rain. No great wind lifts her dress so that we may see the woman, the girl underneath the green, the flesh of the promise, the tired come, the hungry, in masses gray and forever. The land is divided into lines, state, brother, color, north and south, and sister and bloodlines, and the lines continue to threaten until the cup will crack one day, until something more than blood will flow from the earth below. She stands on land that is half island, half haven. They will come because of streets which are gold, because of the burning fields of sugarcane and the burning buildings of genocide, fratricide. They will come from hunger and a thirst for something more ambiguous, something not, never to be found under a rusting steel skirt. Fairies circle like birds or prayers around her. When they come, they will renounce their homelands, their names, and the places of wandering long ago. The old streets melt away already so soon. Now, they turn to face destinies as fragile as islands, the uncertain mooring rocks a lullaby. They are as unknowing as babies. The great green lady never smiles. Her glacial beauty is a mocking promise. And yet, we wait for the wind to blow her dress. We wait for her to reveal her secrets. Thank you. There was an eclipse recently. This is not an eclipse poem, um, but it's close. Um, on December 21st, 2020, there was um, a great conjunction, and I'll let the illustrious earthsky.org magazine um, preface the poem. So the poem is entitled December 21st, 2020. Today's great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn will be highly conspicuous in the West just after sunset. The pair will only be 0.1 degree apart at the exact moment of the conjunction. Some say they will look like an elongated star. Will they? Or will they look like a double planet? Earthsky.org. Fizzle of conjunctions, double forked year. Even suburban trees grow listless, heave at possums. 
Rats take over lilacs and offal. We wait for a falling, for a crowning. I want your fingers here against this moon, my pale face on Zoom, pupils seeking my visage, crackling against so many continences, counting against vaccine odds. Odd how we pace, sun up, faces down to scan carpets, crevices, cedar chips, rank by November. Jupiter and Saturn touch tonight, almost. One bloated ego against rings, restricting even this. I was eye scanning sky, fooled by plain lights, the bodies we miss. Thank you. I, I've read this poem here before, but it's very apt. It's called uh, My Student Cries to Me, and it's an academic advising poem. So my student cries to me. My office, overhead lighting shines me, complicit, greedy. She tells me the professor is racist. She can't pay any more tuition. She designs small hospital gowns, alabaster nurses, hospital gowns, white rooms, is told she can't spell, is called girl twice. I nod, tell her I understand. I grow fat on administration, student objectives, learning out, comes, she beseeches me, wants the words, I agree, this is bias. I turn my screen, consult the guidelines from academic policy, refer her to two other administrators. My eyes dart down. I know you are right. My yellow skin embeds memories and my cheeks burn fuses to your own right now, so hot. I email her the correct PDF. This poem was based on a writing exercise um, where we're list we were told to, to write about something we stole, so that's what I did. And the, the title is called, I Stole That Ring Within Sight. I stole that ring within sight, rust glimmering under neon punk, under Canal Street's trash. It's poverty for song, a sparrow, for distinction between rust or sun, dust or marrow. Mother bought her own ring some years before, before nights of glad shards, howling dogs, machine gunned eyes, scent of MSG from father, a sham. Swimming together away from China, he held to her feet. Here, her bloated belly, she filled me with sea, tentacles alight, his heart pure ink, regret. Dawn. Seven years, then ten years later, she threw small stars into their dingy abyss. Father caught the keys each time. I watched him enter, burn peanut oil, eat bitter melon. Wages in his pocket jingled to nothing. For years, she wanted pieces of diamond, chipped oboe, jade, some emblem of the gold mountain, promise and not my father's waiter shirt, archetypal badge of surrender, a sigh. Where are my gold slippers, my throne, my heart, my sea? Mother chokes salt, begins to fetch. I have two longer pieces. Um, this one is in four parts. It's called Empty. Empty. One. Snow White lived long enough to see her bloom destroy a family. Let me reassure you that I've kept my bloom in check. My body holds a power in the shift of my hips, in the slide of my bones, in the purse of my lips. I move and men respond. Does this frighten you? Will we live out another Snow White story again? 
Soon, I'll shrink. There will be no more competition, no fear, and I'll need less than snowfall to survive. I won't come for anyone, the vacuum between my legs familiar like the coldness of dimes. My hip bones are their own mountains. Every night, I scale them with my fingers, and I always win. I always reach the top. A woman is a vessel. I'll keep my own container empty. It is not a return I want, not to the womb, to the laps of fathers. It is the need for cool blue stars, a body written in angular lines, the truth of a field without wheat or snowfall. No man will fight through the wall of roses for me. No one loves a eunuch, a spinster girl dried out before her time. Two. To float beyond bellies and thighs means to go beyond that body in the bath, languid, dumb to cold and hunger. One by one, we'll scrape out sustenance from the bottoms of bowls, from servings no larger than fists. Our hearts go on yearning as pure muscle, float as angels and vultures searching for dead, decaying matter, good enough for us. This is the fuel we run on. Three, remember, a city street in December and we're holding each other in snowfall. I am five, this is a game. Flakes of snow fall onto our tongues, chocolate, vanilla, mango candy. Around us, the city burns with the cleanness of bones. We are composed of marrow, sinew, radiance. Your arms lock around me. The world locks into a context I can finally understand. I'll never feel this nourished again. Remember this, I have never rejected your body with its milk and musk. Always, there was the wildness of birth between us, upheaval, skin, the thin edges of cliffs worn already. Overhead, skywards, the baby birds call out to the sun. All this need, expanding the sky. Four, dare to live. Wait for me in springtime, when kayla lilies and jasmine blow across our skin. In the silence of bell towers, the echoes come, holy, holy, holy. Forget the rules of marrow and hunger, incessant ice upon your tongue. The oranges are crying out for you. Here is sugar, here is salt. Here is your belly swollen with almonds, chocolate, the fattened beast, the unborn laughter. I have a, a last piece um, that was actually written for my mother, but it really came from a dream. And this piece is called Beyond China. Beyond China. You tell me that you love my hair, its liquid darkness flashing white halos, and you, its emanation. I tell you this darkness is a lie. Once, the sea never knew darkness, but a death beyond longing, far below reaching, where creatures swam in murkier fronds. No entanglements, the play of wholeness, the undividing of continents and countries. And there was this room, an echo, silent temple waiting for deities to fill stones with answers. And always, there was my voice running after yours until each object was pierced by blue staccato, held breathless. Our songs bounced off each other, a refraction of pain, songs which held and did not give back, so filled with gravity were they. We were shamed, naked, searching each other in the astonished air. We were vulnerable like a mouth opening in December. Outside, 
Hands were giant as beggars while they caught silver rain. There was a world in here, and that world was ours. China was an unbroken sky on the other side of the earth. China was the sound of rain before the sky would open, the sound flowers made before a storm, waiting for the dew to keep them that held, intact, lest the separation of sky and earth become unbearable, lest the petals would not hold and disperse. And you say that it's all the same longing. See how you press your body to the mirror because the shock of recognition each time does not erase. And we are in danger of dispersing as petal to stem, a tower to the land, as sands to a devouring sea. Let's go to China one day so that we can forget we ever ached, so that we may forget displacement. My own voice has always run after yours. My own body finds itself tired from aching. So I say yes, because tonight, everything is the sound of a flower drowned by rain. And you say that the room is turning silver. Each drop of rain holds a question mark, and the sky is beginning to wonder. China is slipping further away from us. I'm afraid I cannot remember. No. This room is dark like yesterday, and last year, and a thousand years before us, when grievances were violet, the night yet whole. Go, but let me give you my face. Let your fingers give themselves to my body so that each may swell with the luxury of remembrance, because it is time which forgets so quickly, like water in fluid undulation in its liquid achingness. I would love you beyond China. I would love you beyond silver and desolation and secret places where the ground is swollen with remembrance and snow-capped mountains are wounded by starlight. Because in silver, in the tower, in the open hands of strangers, we still search in astonished air. My hair is still dark and you are still its emanation. We are still in this room, in America, and not China, and there is nothing but falling rain. Thank you. All right. I, I think this is it. Thank you, I appreciate it. Do I need to introduce anyone else? No? All right. <laughs> Thank you to our keynote speaker for sharing all of your poetry with us. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for the Educator Showcase. Remember to thank and appreciate the teachers in your lives. They foster the minds of our generation and it's clear our youth is in good hands. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I hope to see you at more events at the Brockton Public Library. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>